in the streets, huh? Lick and murder you on tape now. How I'm supposed to eat, huh? When my pockets getting raped, why? Officers oversee the demise of the family. Prisons are property. I'ma buy one and release me. That's the sound of your last dream. That's the sound of your dead son. How he only 12? But you saw him and he had a gun? Say your name. School you work for and the program you're with. First, you know, the deal, you gotta get your name, what you do here, where you're from. My name is Adrian Durrell Blackstock. Nice. My name is Adrian. I work for um, CTLC, which is Center for Teaching and Learning in China, and I, I teach at Nanshan Second Foreign Language School. I'm from the USA. Virginia, specifically, Danville, Virginia. And I teach third, fourth, and fifth grade, so eight, nine, and ten year olds. I'm here as a musician and as a teacher. I teach drums, English, and uh, I play music at night. I play in a couple bands. I have my own band. It's called Dragon Turtle. Hopefully, you'll see some of that stuff later. And uh, I love it here. Shenzhen is an awesome place. Cool experience. Everybody, what's up? It's your boys from Black and China, house co homie Marcus, Comatic, my man Adrian, that's what we're doing today. Back from China, we in Danville, Virginia. Danville, the last capital of the Confederacy. Last time I, <laughs> last Wait, time really? I saw you. Really? Man. Is that why the giant? That's why we got the giant Confederate flags everywhere. It was the last one. They burnt down, after they burnt down Atlanta, they moved the capital, I think, to Richmond. Mm -hmm. And then it was a, a big battle in Richmond, and they burnt down a lot of downtown Richmond, and they moved it here. And it was the last, the last resort before, before the, um, I guess it was Robert E. Lee gave up, yeah. surrendered. Yeah. 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 So yeah, he surrendered, and this was the last capital of Confederacy. So it was the last stronghold. The last stronghold, man. Mm -hmm. Danville. All right. It always trips me out because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a lot of history here. Um, as far as like the civil rights movement, you know, Martin Luther King marched through here a few times actually. Wow. And I spoke on Danville a couple of times and um, actually if you, if you're into the, the NGE, the Nation of the Gods and the Earths, mm -hmm. uh, Clarence the 13th is from Danville. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, Clarence the 13th. The father. Of the Gods and Earths. Indeed. So Clarence the 13th is from here. And so that tripped me out, just like knowing some of the, the little pieces of history that this little town, like... It was the best kept secret. Like literally, I did not know until just now you said that Dr. King marched through here. Yeah, Dr. Times. King marched through here, I think twice. Definitely once. And um, spoke here. And uh, sometimes on the radio, they play a little bit of his speech when uh, his birthday comes around. That's beautiful. Yeah, man, it's, it's great. Here we are. Nice. In Danville. Danville. How does it feel to be back? Oh man, it's been, it's been great. It's been bittersweet in a lot of ways because like I've just changed so much since I've been gone. Mm -hmm. Like my taste buds have changed, my uh, my habits, my habits have changed. So in a lot of ways, it's been a lot of nostalgia. Like mm -hmm. I I went to Dillard's, I bought a Sega, the <laughs> old school Sega. So I've been playing that in here, wow. and it just takes me back like 20 years when I was here doing the exact same thing, playing the exact same games. And uh, I'm engaged now. Mm -hmm. Before, Congratulations. Uh, thank you, thank you to thank my you. beautiful fiance. You can get her in the shot? Yeah, yeah. Come on over, babe. Say hi. She's cooking right now. Yeah. And, um, Appreciate it. At some point, right. we'll get her a shot with you. We'll get yeah, her a shot. Yeah, yeah. She's, She's also responsible for the ambient noises of chopping and blending and stuff, so I appreciate that. Indeed. So, and I mean, it's been great to be around my family. Like, a, a lot of people have grown up, some people have a. Uh, gone on to the next life, passed away. Mm, yeah. Um, my nephew, my godson, he's my godson and my nephew, like he's grown up so much and so it's good to just be back around my family, you know, be back around your friends. I know you guys can relate and uh and just be out of China for a little while. <laughs> Cause it's an intense place. So is this your first time back in a while? My first time back for Christmas, for sure, for the holidays. Nice. And since I left. Since I left. How long ago has that been? Five years. Five years. So five this is your years. first time back in five years. Five years. For Christmas, for sure. For Christmas. Yeah. For I sure. came back from summers and like uh I came back 
two years ago for Black History Month. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> which is also Chinese New Year. Yeah, which is also oh, Chinese well, New okay. Year, but so you know, don't, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell them that. But, uh, yeah, just being back for Christmas, being back for the holidays, Kwanzaa, all that good stuff. What's the day? Fire Gotti. Was it Kuchi Jackali? Ujima. Nice. Ujima. Collective work and responsibility. It's the perfect day for you guys to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's who should have come on the sixth day. That's creativity, you feel me? Right. That's my favorite day, Kumba. Okay. Okay. But Kuchi Chakali is mine. It's my favorite day. You use that for termination. Yeah. Collective work to get down here. Yeah. That's what we did. I appreciate that. No, I appreciate that. The gas. Yeah. Nevertheless, how has you been, you know, you coming back, you seeing Danville, um, Pretty much different from the way you left it. Mm. Has that influenced your music in any way? Is it is there some type of inspiration that may come of this being back home? Oh, for sure. Like uh, I already got two new projects I want to work on when I mm. get back. I want to do like a jazz a jazz hop album. Jazz like, album. Take, oh, take old jazz records and like sample them and use them because I was listening to the, the the Durham Jazz Station at North Carolina Central where I used to go to school. Mm -hmm. They have like the only jazz station in the area and they just be pumping it all the time, 24 seven. Like, so um, listening to that, uh, I guess a couple of nights ago, but actually being home, like being around my cousins and being around my, my, my younger, they're not, I guess when I left, they were, you know, teenagers, like just coming into their own. Mm -hmm. And like men back now, they're like adults. Wow. And so like, Part of me is like always conscious of like the influence that I have, the voice that I have, and make sure I'm using it in a way where like these cats listen to my record, mm -hmm. they'll say, you know, my cousin is a positive dude, you know, like, or my cousin has something to say. And my cousin's different. His music isn't like everything that everybody else is doing. Right. So that's what I want them to say when they listen to it. And I still have a, I have a, a my cousin Jerry, he's still making music. They're all involved in their own little ways of, you know, like being connected to me through music. So it's been great. Have they been able to, I mean, cause we're in the age, you know, the digital age where you don't need to physically be in a studio with right. anyone anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we get so many collaborations. Have you all been able to, I guess, even with the time difference and the difficulties of the Chinese internet, you know, right. y'all been able to collaborate on anything virtually or did they help you your last project? Cause I know, it's really, it's funny because when I would tell people, oh yeah, my man just dropped this album, like check it out, and they'll look at the the, the, the cover, right. and then they'll look at the name, and they'll be like, oh, and I'm like, nah, it, Virginia to China, like you gotta, right. you, and I was like, but I guess you gotta see it and know it. Right. Mm -hmm. so I was like, you know what, I'm tired of explaining this. Right. Just think what you think, listen to the music. Right, listen right. To, but I'm curious that they, you know, since they're in the music, did they have anything to do with it or did you, were you able to bring them in or anything or are you going are you, are you now working towards bringing them in on anything or? uh for me like with my cousin like i just i wanted him to do i didn't want to have too much influence on what he was doing so mm -hmm. i just wanted him to do his own thing whenever he wanted to reach out to me he could but uh with other people like my friends like i definitely have like some songs with some of my brothers from richmond and uh and I definitely, for the second album, I used the guy here to mix it. Oh, okay. And so a guy here mixed it and mastered it. Uh, Crook, Crook the Composer, uh, if you ever need him, look him up on Facebook. Crook the Composer? Crook the Composer. Yeah, that sounds yeah. dope already. Yeah, he's great. Crook the Composer and um, working with him has been great. But I think with my cousin, he's just doing his own thing. Like they got their own sound and they, they like old school, like recording on the computer mics, like leaning over the laptop. like. Mm. So maybe I could have some more influence on, on him in that way, but he's just doing his thing and I'm just, he works at a community center okay. in his community. They live in a neighborhood called the Bricks, which is basically the hood. Like I don't even drive over there at night because the police gonna pull you over type mm -hmm. situation, search your car. <laughs> so, uh, so he's been a really great influence on his neighborhood. Like they had him in a magazine talking about all the things he's been doing, like working at the community center with the kids. So I think, you know, I'm not always around, but I feel like, like having my grandma, having my mom here, and like just my influence has helped him think about giving back to his community. I won't take credit for what he's doing because what he's doing is amazing. So, but I definitely feel like you know we looks to you a little bit. We Problem. were raised to do that. Problem, we, were, <laughs> we were raised to we were raised to give back to our community. Like we were raised to use our talents and our gifts. Like I went to church 
you know, three to five days a week, some mm -hmm. weeks, like all the time singing, singing every Sunday, either I'm playing drums or singing. So like our family has always been, you know, very community oriented, especially with music. So. So, you already started working on the next project, or is it right now you still like just enjoying time, being home and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just enjoying home right now, and just like reading, getting my ideas together. Like, cause you gotta, I think, I think there's a season for all of it. You know, like there's a season to grind, and there's a season to like, like regather your mental health so and like just relax. Just be with family, mm -hmm. support them, like get, give them an opportunity to support you. And that's where I'm at right now. It's just like enjoying home. I haven't even been doing my workouts half the time. Just like some days I do some, do a little yoga, but that's it. Which is one of the things is like my, my habits as far as like working out, like trying to be a little bit more healthy, more yeah. conscious, like what my food, the food that I put in my body, for example. Um, how angry and how frustrated I allow other people to, to or how angry I and frustrated I get at other people. Mm -hmm. Like um, that's something that I've been working on since I've been gone, and not you know, not being focused on like negativity and distractions. So that's changed a lot for me. So coming back home, where sometimes you know confrontation. America is a very confrontational place. Like mm -hmm. people are all about it. They get a chance to like be confrontational. They jump at it. You know, and uh, like. And and I've just actually went the opposite direction. Like I see confrontation, I'm going the other way. Like I don't want nothing to do with it. Like I don't want no problems. <laughs> like no problems. Over here, people hate forever. Right. So, so, you so know, yeah, exactly. So it's like it's grown. As soon as you come out your doors, hate. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and it's crazy. It's crazy it to see. Crazy. So but, I guess the question I want to I want to ask because you you said that pretty much a lot of your habits, your mm. mindset, all that has changed mm. since you left. Mm. How has China impacted the way you've done things when you came back? Because like you said, you know, it's 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 nearly unavoidable to right. encounter hate here. No right. matter where you go, someone's going to dislike you, right. either for the color of your skin, right. the color of sneakers you're wearing, or right. the color t-shirt you're wearing. Right. So being in China and in these habits that you have, I want to say, cultivated there and bringing them back to America, how different is it? as opposed to when you left. How different is America? Or well, no, how, how different are your habits? Like for example, you said okay. you uh, you ran away from confrontation. You mm -hmm. go the other way. Right. Before, did you go towards it? No, I never, you? I never been a confrontational person in mm -hmm. general, but um, sometimes before I would, I would stay and take it, you know, oh, and wow. like, you know, like absorb it, mm -hmm. you know, and like almost internalize it and make it my own voice, you know, wow. and and that was just horrible. That's just not good for your your, your mental health. Thanks. And so I I've learned to like just like this is nonsense. You're speaking nonsense, and I don't have to listen to you. Like and and China taught me, you know, thick skin. Like everybody's staring at you. Everybody has something to say about you. Everybody, especially you know when you're black. So everybody's staring. Everybody looking at you. Everybody has something to say. Some of it's slick and mm. like not positive. Some of it's like curious and like oh his hair is different. Oh he's so black. Or like, you know, oh, oh, he's like, you know, a what? A foreigner has a, walked a foreigner. on the bus. Yeah, a foreigner's here. Oh my God, everybody, look at the foreigner. Like that type of situation. Synchronized like that. So now, you know, my, my fiance is uh, Spanish. So she's white, she's white skinned. And like walking around here in America, you know, people look, people stare. And it's like, that doesn't even bother me. Cause like, I'm used to that. Like mm -hmm. we're both used to it. Like where in China, everybody's looking at you and it's like, and you get some confused looks and some like curious looks and all of it's the same. So that has changed for me a lot. Like how, like other, there's no negative, inf I, I guess I don't get as influenced externally from external forces as I was before. Mm. I started meditating in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of friends that were like really into it and like really go really deep with meditation and like doing a lot of conferences and going to different places. and. So I started meditating when I was in China and I didn't do that before. And uh, it's really helped me to just be calm and have patience, and be wow. peaceful in that way. Um, so that's been different. Uh, I started working out more consistently before. Uh, before I went to China, I, I never completed any of those 60 day, 90 day programs, <laughs> P90X or Shanti. Now I can do it easy. Like mm. if I start a program, I can finish it, no problem. Wow. 
Um, but are you cool with them just yelling at you? Like, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it because I don't. I hate going to the gym, especially if it's cold. I hate giving, having to get up and go somewhere. Like I can do it right here. Oh, I just moved the table and I'm good. <laughs> All right. So yeah, like, so you finally came home for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I know being in Shenzhen during Christmas, I know what it's like to be overseas during oh, Halloween. You know, Shenzhen, it's very like, all right, we're gonna put up this tree. You're a foreigner. Merry Christmas. Here's a party for you. Right. See you at work tomorrow. Like, right. <laughs> you know, how does it feel to like have the I, essentially the whole outs, you know, the whole world seeming like it's just up. Oh, we're just shutting down. Nobody can do nothing. I mean. Since what December twenty third to like the twenty sixth, nobody does anything here. Mm -hmm. It's like, how's that? You know, just the dynamic versus like Christmas overseas versus Christmas at home. Uh, Christmas overseas is like it's totally a capitalist holiday. You know, like as far as like in China, the expression of Christmas is all about the presents and the gifts and nothing else. Not mm -hmm. no like. The spirit, like there's decorations for sure, but it's like no caroling, not a lot of singing. It's not a like, it's definitely not about the religious aspect of the holiday at all. You know, when it comes to any religious celebration that happens during that time, whether it be Hanukkah, whether it be Kwanzaa, whether it be Christmas, whether it be, um, you know, the celebrating celebration of you know Horus or whoever you want to celebrate during that time. So there's no actual like religious or any type of connotation spiritual meaning spiritual meaning i mean for the the mat for the for the mass population no i mean, I mean there's definitely you know christians in china it's like yeah. there's everything everywhere but um and there are people who definitely go to church and have that part of the celebration that element of it like mm -hmm. i have some friends who are musicians at the church so they like have service that night and play um but for us like we just got a christmas party everybody get drunk and that was it and then you go to that yuletide day. cheer and you get a work cup speaking of that like my thing is like being that you said being a foreigner and celebrating Christmas abroad it's vastly different. Mm. Okay, um, in China, from the Chinese population, do they act? Because you know in America, when it's around the holiday time, people's like, all right, so for one week out of the year, I'm gonna be nice to everybody. Mm. You know, you get that whole what's it? What, what's the word I want to use? When you feel as though you're obligated to be nice, right? Because of the holiday spirit. season, yeah, yeah, yeah spirit. Yeah. Like, yeah. do they treat foreigners different? Being that it's even like it's super commercialized, do they have the spirit, quote unquote? Do you feel like Chinese people are nicer to foreigners now, or they're more courteous? I don't. I only spent one Christmas in China, and I can tell you. I mean, <laughs> I don't remember anybody being nicer to me. I was about to say, the time I think it was of just the year. another day. Because yeah, in America, you know, it's a thing though. Yeah. Like low key, like being nicer time. Well, maybe not. <laughs> not in your experience, guy. Right. But. I don't know. For me, I mean, like people be nice to me when they wanted something from me, but that's everywhere. But no, like for example, I go to like Walmart the whole time, and then somebody let me, somebody will buy my stuff in front of me. He's like, oh, the dude uh, in front of you just bought whatever you had in your hands. Now, mind you, it might be a Slim Jim, right? But it's the thought that they even say, you know, I got the Slim Jim on the guy behind me. I've right. had something like that happen in Shenzhen. Uh, it, had no, it had nothing to do with the time of the year. It was like someone was just being nice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like I had a whole thing of fruit, and the person in front of me was like practicing his English with me. Um, and this is during the time where I had like zero, zero Chinese. Mm. And what even made it worse was like, my man was speaking Cantonese. So like, even when I was trying to figure stuff out, oh, I was wow. like, what is this? Like your language sounds way different <laughs> than these other people's languages that I'm trying to figure out. And he had a whole conversation with the lady and then he tried to like, what he did was he tried to like scoop check my stuff into his. And I was like, boy, what are you doing? Like, give me my stuff. Like, these are my apples. These are my oranges. <laughs> this is my iced tea. Like, and then he just, then I think he started speaking like a little bit of Putonghua. And it's like, I don't know what you're saying. And then the lady like, just kind of like started like snatching it, scanning, 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 put it in a bag and hands it to me. And he was like, it was nice to talk to you. Uh, this is a present. And I was like, oh shit, thanks. <laughs> But they had, it had nothing to do, like, it was randomly in October. Right. Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it was a Halloween gift. I don't think he knew anything about it. I feel it. like I Halloween think, is even bigger. I think it was actually like the day opinion. after I met you, matter of fact. Really? Because we met at a Halloween party. Yeah. I think. I think uh, yeah. Yeah, Halloween's bigger. Well, I, I feel like just because... The, the theatrics of it, you know, like dressing up. People get caught up in the hype. Yeah, you go out. Not the candy. There's no candy. But like, <laughs> like the dressing up and like getting crazy and going to a party or something. Like a lot of people do 
that. You know what I mean, I feel like that that's like even more universal than in Christmas. That you're dressing up being something else, right? But there's no candy, no trick or treat. I don't know why. I mean, the foreigner. I guess foreigners, foreign communities, they they trick or treat a little bit, but right. not not for the most part. Doesn't make good for trick or treating if no one got the candy. Though. Right. Doesn't make good for go to a business going door to door in China. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would even say that in in I guess depending on where you are, if it's my Mandarin, uh, you say what trick or treat? Yeah. No idea. No idea. No idea. I'm not even gonna try candies. So, <laughs> um, is there anything that any noticeable differences that hit you immediately when you came back to Danville? Well, America in general, just mm -hmm. the size. Just the size? Size of everything. Oh. Everything is bigger. Everything is bigger. Like, you go to McDonald's, the cups are bigger. You go to, <laughs> you go to, you know, a restaurant and eat. The portion size are humongous. Mm. Uh, the people, the people are bigger. Excessive. Like, everybody, everything is big. So everything you can see where that stereotype comes in. Right, everything is huge. It's like they say everything is big in Texas, but no, everything is big in America Mer in general. <laughs> so in China, you're primarily based in Shenzhen, right? Yeah, in China, I'm in, yep, in Shenzhen. I've been in Shenzhen five years. Mm -hmm. I lived in Beijing for a month, the first month. Mm -hmm. Just like doing tourism stuff, seeing everything, Great Wall and stuff like that. But I've been in Shenzhen the whole time. Mm -hmm. Shenzhen, Hong Kong. But I travel all over Guangdong, playing in Guangzhou and playing in and uh, Dongguan and uh, some other places. I've heard Dongguan's come up. Yeah, like. man, Dongguan, I love Dongguan, yeah. honestly. Like, if, if you're thinking about moving to China and you wanna move someplace where people are really nice and people are really chill and people are really, like, you have a community, then Dongguan or Zhuhai is the place to go. Because, like, it's, Dongguan is old. Like, it's a really old city, mm -hmm. but, the foreign community is pretty small, and uh, except for the Brazilians, it's like thirty thousand Brazilians there. Cause like all the factories that closed in Brazil moved to Dongguan. Like mm -hmm. all the sh shoe and furniture and like. And see, I remember when, up in the when I first got there, they had they had just shut down the Nike factory, so there was like a flood of like into like all the Shenzhen markets, like all these like random Nikes. So I was like, yo, how are they getting these? And they're like, right. oh, from like the old factories. And I also remember, what was it? month after living there i think i was going to guangzhou and i was like what is in dongguang like what's here and somebody was like and it was a chinese person they're like oh um prostitutes oh yeah like, what <laughs> they, well, they just got right to the point dongguang used to be the, the the prostitution capital of southern china then they shut that down because then cnn found out about it and yeah. did, did a piece and it was like oh no we can't have this mm. shut that down so it used to be the yeah so my question is, <laughs> and I, I, this is something I've always wanted to know, because like when I met you in September of 2015, when I came over, it's like you was you was a hardworking man. It, he's counting. <laughs> Go for it. I don't know years. I forgot it was 2017. Yeah, it's 2017. I was like, I thought this year was 2015. That's why nah, I started counting. He's like, nah. My thing is, you talked about the uh, the festivals that they had, the Midi Music the Festival and everything. I just wanted to know your experience as a black artist working in a, a Chinese society trying to book gigs at these festivals, mm -hmm. did you face any type of issues, any hurdles, just getting on the stage or getting a call back? Did you get to run around? Did they try to lowball you? Like, I hate to be asking so many questions. No, no, that's It's good. just really fascinating to meet a black artist right. operating outside what would be considered the norm. It's been, uh, it's been tough because our particular project isn't like a lot, like, I don't, we don't have a band. Right. I just, I make the, I produce the music myself and then, um, so it's backing tracks. Mm. And then I have dancers, I have my fiance, and then I have another young lady who's a Chinese young lady, and we have two dancers. And so it's me and the dancers. And because of that, like, we can't necessarily get booked in the clubs because it's original music. It's not like we were doing covers. Like if I was just doing Jason Derulo songs and Bruno Mars, like we can play any club in China. You know, really? That so would they be like really covers? Easy. Yeah, I mean, because it's already famous, they heard it before, you know, it's copycat stuff. It's just like go-go music. Right. It's like copycat stuff. Like copycat stuff is like, you know, really popular. Or, and then like at the live house venues, like we can't get booked there because we don't actually play the music live. Uh -huh. You know, so it's like our project ended up in like this really hard niche to book sometimes because, um, you know, we don't necessarily have the following of like this major artist coming from the West who's doing what we're doing. Like if Flo Rida came over, 
You know, he could get booked anywhere, but he's doing the same thing I'm doing. Like, he's just, you know, performing his original music with tracks and, but he don't even have dancers. Like, oh wait, maybe he does, but he doesn't even dance. I'm not dissing Flo Rida, Flo Rida's dope. But what I'm saying is that other people coming from the West, you know, can, you know, with, with, with a certain level of notoriety, you know, can, can book those gigs, no problem. But for me, like, it's been really a struggle and like people turning us down and saying no, or sometimes like not not promoting the show, and it'd be like ten people there. Oh, Cause we did a tour, we did a tour. Our last tour when we did we dropped the second album, the last tour wasn't so successful because a lot of the venues like didn't necessarily like promote the show, and I can only promote so much like right to because people I don't know. You're it's doing like, everything. Right? Yeah, so you're I mean, making like, the music, you're writing the lyrics, you're recording, you're engineering, you're yeah. mixing, everything, everything. Right, right to because people I don't know. You're doing like, everything. Right? Yeah, so you're I mean, making like, the music, you're writing the lyrics, you're everything. recording, you're engineering, you're yeah. mixing, everything, everything. Except well, some other people mix and master it, but as far as like putting together the show, like. You know, whether it be like buy, buying the outfits, you know, oh, wow. like scheduling the practices, like, um, you know, make, doing all the tracking stuff, uh, booking the stuff with the venues, talking to the venues, like talking to the booking agents, the booking managers, trying to get all that stuff connect, connected with everybody. Like, I do that, all that by myself. Um, and obviously my fiance supports me. She choreographs the stuff and she like coordinates a lot of stuff with like the show mm -hmm. on stage, but everything else, like I'm, I'm doing by myself. So it's not easy, but it's doable. You know, it's like totally doable. I've totally like, I don't work, I don't teach anymore. Like last time mm. we did this, I was teaching. Right. Like I don't teach anymore. I was only doing music. Um, my visa was for music. Um, so, but I had to supplement it. Like because I play drums and I sing, like I play in some cover bands and I play drums and I could play bars, I play live houses and stuff. So it allowed me the opportunity to do my music because I could support myself you know, playing everybody's music. Mm -hmm. so. so, but yeah, you said you're moving to Spain, which is cool. But I guess my first question, I mean, before that, for real, not just, I mean, I was, I mean, you kind of alluded to it. You moved to Spain, because you're getting married. So now I gotta ask the sappy question. How y'all met? Oh Ooh. man, um, we met at a, I used to host the open mic in, in Shenzhen. We met in Shenzhen, of course. I used to host an open mic at this bar called Rapscallions, and it was like the spot to go on Thursday night. Rapscallions. And so anybody that came through there, anybody, everybody came through on Thursday night because there's basically nothing else to do in the city. It's mm -hmm. like, well, you could do other stuff, but. Why would you want to? Why would you want to? Because Thursday night was hop happening at Raps. And um, actually, I seen her in a WeChat group before. I seen her picture, and I was like, I want to meet this girl. You know, and I was like, I can't wait to meet her. And then she showed up one night, and then uh, I was just like, Hey, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. It's been great ever since. And uh, she's from Spain, and she's been traveling all over China, dancing, and um, and teaching, and and dancing in clubs, or dancing workshops, and dancing in world of dance, and all types of stuff. So she's a grinder, and I'm just happy. Lucky boy. Come on, come say hi to the people. Yeah, that's right. yeah, hi to the camera. She's been cooking the food, yeah. so we're gonna eat. Low key in the background. Low key in the back, hello. so hello. say hello. 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 This camera. Yeah, oh, you gotta bend down because oh. it's like this. <laughs> this is my fiance. It's all torso. She's great. And she's from Tanadife, so, mm -hmm. which is the Canary Islands. And oh, you wow. said it started by saying, hey, I want to talk hey, to you. Hey, I want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm like, hey. that. I'm like, hey, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I want to talk to you. I work for my man Adrian. Why can't it work for me? Oh, it'll work. It works. As soon as you do your research. So. <laughs> I did my research. <laughs> research had to be done. I did my research. You ain't say nothing about homework, homeboy. Yeah, you got to do your homework. Man. I don't like homework. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's probably why I'm alone. So man, you ain't done. There's that. There's that. <laughs> Yeah, man, I was like, yeah, so I got lucky. I got really lucky, and she's just been awesome. And, and like, um, it's been great to have our support in China. Mm -hmm. The reason why we're moving, though, which is another great story, mm -hmm. is that um, is that one day, maybe this was like October or, or September. September. September, October, late October, early October, late September, people just showed up at her job and was like, hey, uh, is your is, is Bea's boyfriend here? Asking, looking for looking for her, looking for me. But they didn't even know my name. Just looking for me by, you know, just because I'm associated with her. Like, looking for her boyfriend. 
the police, police showed up. It was like, it's Bear's boyfriend here. And I'm like, so then she gets home, she tells me, and I'm like, I wonder why the police looking for me. Like, what, what I did, right? What I didn't did. Like, who I didn't shot. Oh, you can't okay. shoot nobody. Was child, and it was on her day off, so she wasn't there either. And so that happened, and we was just like, you know, it happened, we forget about it. And then, like, a month later, like, maybe three weeks, a month later, they, the police come back on a Saturday when she was there. And it was like, uh, we need to see your passport. Like, um, we got, we got to, we, we, we know that you're working illegally. We know that you're working here illegally. So we need to see your passport. We need to like, we need all of this, like right now. And so she didn't have her passport with me. So she had to rush home. And I was at work at the time I was teaching and I had to rush home to grab it and like bring it out for her. Cause like at the time, like her visa was for tourism. So she wasn't supposed to be working, mm. which is a problem. If you ever working on tourism, tourist visa in China, it's tough. Like make sure you try to get your paperwork straight make sure you try to get you know business visa or work visa because working on a tourist visa is dangerous man it's dangerous you can go to jail for two weeks and then they deport you point blank period and so and find you, and find you up to up to twenty five thousand twenty five thousand up to twenty thousand quad depending on how long you've been doing it like they can like, they can find you up to twenty five thousand quads from five to twenty five that's crazy man. right so and five just to let y'all know that's that's eight hundred dollars yeah in america 800 is in American, so 25. Yeah, that's five, that's about 500 pounds. Right. And then, yeah. It's about 8,000 euros, 3,500. Somewhere, no, no. somewhere between five and eight. 3,000 dollars. So, just for working illegally. So, make sure you, you get your company to give you good yeah, paperwork. It's, it's, it won't stay on. <laughs> Oh, sorry about no, that. No, no, you, you so, so then know. they showed up. They, the police put her in the car, brought her to my house. I ran yeah, in, got yeah. the passport, came out, gave him the passport. Then we had a hearing on Monday. Mm. This was like the Monday of the big conference that they just had that started in Beijing. This was the Monday that started. The bricks. Was I was I was I hearing? So I while she was in the hearing, they were like. Um, they were like, somebody had to have reported you because we don't even have enough staff for like us to be randomly going around places. So somebody called and like reported us for oh, illegally yeah, working. That's wild petty. That right. is mad petty. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Just that whole, whole idea that like <laughs> somebody, somebody could a job. Big not time. like us that much. Somebody was big mad. So yeah. So in our hearing, you know, during the hearing, the guy leaves, he goes to talk to his superior and he's like, you know, all foreigners that, that get brought in here from this day forward, we immediately deport them. Like while we're in our hearing, like that that happens because that was the Monday morning that the meeting started, mm. and so it's like so when in China, like they have laws and they're all serious, but they only crack down on them during certain times. Like if there's like a big government, you know, thing oh, going on. Oh, this is during the People's Conference. It was during the People's Conference, so uh, it's the first day of the People's Conference. So any big government thing going on. That was Xi Jinping. He was in that joint flexing too. Like anybody, like they will. Everybody can get it. They cut it down. Anybody can get it. Whether you're riding a, a motor scooter, which is illegal, whether you, uh, you know, going to yeah, you know, the <laughs> side places, or whether you're like working illegally, if you're doing anything that's on the on the line, you know, you have to watch it during that time. Goodness gracious. So, so basically, if you're still in China right now watching this, yes. During them times, like my man, watch CGTN. Mm. Stay in the house. Just right. like know which days to stay in the house. Right. That's like weird. I mean, seriously, like you get into any altercation in a club, mm. you know, or in a restaurant, See like you going free to free window, way, free window, man. And you in any type of situation like that, you can end up in jail because like they just locking everybody up, especially foreigners during this time. I mean, everybody, but. You know, especially foreigners doing involved in anything that might be shady or illegal. So Or that they don't like. So the hearing so my 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 fiance showed like all our portraits of like representing China and the world of dance in America, like how she's like been giving back through dance to China, like how she's been teaching kids and like what she's been doing hasn't been like she just like working in clubs, like no, she's teaching, like she's actually like giving knowledge and giving information. And the business was so small that when actually tried to apply for legit licenses, y'all, they said they couldn't even get it. It was like, no, your business is too small. You don't even make enough money. So then it's like when you say that at first, but then like six months later, you show up and like try to arrest her. So, 
So after communicating that with the guy in the hearing, like everything was good. And he was like, all right, like we're not gonna put this in now, but y'all, you have to come back in a month. And uh, we'll figure it out then once the, once the conference is over. So they didn't put it in that day and they actually let her keep working. And so 30 days passed and like they never hit us back up. And so it was like, man, we just won't move. Like we just need to get out right, of here. Yeah, get out of Dodge. Cause like, I mean, I don't know who reported us. We'll never know. We never know, and it could be somebody that I see every day, or it could be somebody that I just like pissed off one day, like in passing, and they just so happen to find out, you know, that you were my girlfriend, and so reported us that way. So that was the main reason where it's like, I don't know if I can be in a place where you know it's like that shady, you know, that type of shadiness, but you know, I can't, you can't blame the whole society or whole group of people, and I'm not trying to, mm -hmm. but I will say that, you know, jealousy is a real thing. And in China, it's all about face. Mm -hmm. And if you miss the opportunity to give somebody face and they really want it, really need it, like, you could find yourself in some shit. Like, some serious negative situations. It's a very fine line to, to toe around, It's though. a very it's fine like line. Jealousy got could get so-and-so deported. Right. Envy could get so-and-so sent back or mess up their situation. Right. Or someone detained without trial. Right. Hashtag yeah. free Wendell Brown. Free Wendell Brown. Free Wendell Brown. Man. It's so crazy that... Uh, man so like yeah so that's the ugly the ugly side of living abroad specifically living in China is that you know the, the government doesn't necessarily support you um, and I don't I don't say nothing to negatively say anything about the government like Chinese government has done a lot for society it's changed you know the projection of their society so much especially in the last 50 years like that you got to respect it but when it comes to like dealing with foreigners um, it's not always so positive especially black foreigners. So, uh, when I say, when I say, I guess the, the local government or just Chinese government didn't necessarily support me as a foreigner, this mm -hmm. is what I mean in this particular situation. I was, my, myself, my fiance and a bunch of other foreigners were hanging out in Baisha Joe, which is where I lived. And Baisha Joe is like an urban village. And it's basically like the hood <laughs> in Shenzhen, in my opinion, you know. It's Baisha like, Joe is lit, but it is where all the construction work, like when they were building the city, that's where they house all the uh, people that they bust in to build the city. Right, mm -hmm. so it's like a lot of construction work. It's poor housing there, it's nice housing there. It's like, imagine like the neighborhood where the train tracks, where you got both sides Ooh. of the train tracks right there. That's what Baisha Joe is, in my opinion. Mm. So, trap. Yeah, so um, we were there were there are three foreigner bars in Baisha Joe in this one little area, like this one little street, and then there's a bunch of Chinese restaurants around it, and there there are two breweries and one like live house slash club slash everything. We were there. We were hanging out in between these three bars, and we were just like eating and having a good time. It was a bunch of foreigners, and these these Chinese guys were sitting at this table at the, one of the Chinese restaurants like next door. And um, and one of them had spoke to me as I passed and I like looked at him and I just kept walking. Like I didn't like negatively, like, I didn't do anything negative. I didn't necessarily say hello back either. Like I didn't mm -hmm. speak. So I, maybe I didn't give him face. You know, maybe um, I embarrassed him by not saying hello back when he said hello to me. And then um, I was standing there with my friends and with, with Bay and this other guy, another drummer named Kevin, who's actually in Florida right now, American white guy and uh next thing you know we're just standing there and a chair a uh, like steel like hard chair comes flying over my head and like hits both of them like literally like hits them and so like now like the whole everything is in an uprise like everybody's like what the like it's going crazy like what is going on so come to find out it was those guys at the table that spoke to me earlier like they like one of them had picked up the chair and fucking tossed it into this crowd of foreigners like for no reason unprovoked i i mean and it, there's videotape to, to prove that it was unprovoked he just literally was sitting there he was looking and he got up and then he like he even like did this twice and then just flung it then just flung the chair so like she's like in pain, like headache, and I know she had you had a mini, you definitely had a mini coma, like what what is it, whatever it's concussion. called, a concussion for sure. Oh, definitely had a mini concussion because like her head was hurting for like weeks, you know, like maybe like a month after that. And so like rather than be violent or like, cause I'm I, again like I said, I'm try, I'm all about peace, like 
especially like even when provoked i'm like all about peace like all about like because then again but my friends on these bars like anything happens like they shutting down the foreigner bars first thing they're gonna do shut down the foreigner bars like so if it's a fight any type of scrap also like i partake in certain things that if i go to jail they, you know, I'm gonna stay in jail. So I'm like, I don't want no parts of going to prison. Like, I don't want no fights. I don't want no violence. But I'm pissed. I'm so I mean, pissed. Yeah. I'm so pissed. Like, cause I know he was aiming. He, I don't. I don't know that he was aiming at me. But like, the chair flew over my head, and I had interacted with him. So I felt like he was aiming at me. But he just missed. It hit my girlfriend instead, and my friend. So like I'm consoling her, like I'm holding her, like my friends are like all trying to defend me, like this is a big ruckus. And then like the owner of Magma, he's like, man, let's just go to the police, let's go to the police, let's do this right, let's go to the police, let's go to the police. I'm like, all right, let's go to the police. So I'm holding my girl, they get in the car, they go to the police, I run run back to the house, I grab my passports, meet them at the police station. Mm -hmm. So the guy that actually threw the chair, he 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 peaced. Like he disappeared. His friends went to the police station, but the guy that actually did it, he disappeared. So his friends were there, they were explaining the story. And it was like somebody had su supposedly said they were like stupid Chinese people, like try making up a story. I'm like, even if so, even if somebody did say something, like when did like speaking become like equivalent? For, Chair throwing. Be, yeah, became just justify a justification for violence. Like that's not how it works in America. Like I could say anything I want, but as soon as somebody like touches me, like that's a different story, you know, so. But even then, like I know I didn't say it, and I know my, I know you didn't say it, and I know Kevin didn't say it. So the three people that were most affected by the chair, I know they had nothing, to, you know, to do with this conversation. So like the police were saying this, all this, blah, 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 and then I'm like, all right. So I'm like, I'm like, well, you just like you don't really have any proof, and I'm like, man, we got the videotape. Like I know it's pretty good proof. So I was like, so the owner he goes like checks the videotape, like we send the videotape to police, everything, nothing, no justice, no nothing. No, no conversation, no like brush this on the table, let's handle it. No, nothing, like nothing, literally nothing. Like, um, did never heard back from the police. Like, the business never heard back from the police. Like, nothing, like literally nothing came of it. And it was like, man, I, it, the reason it still sticks with me to this day, because it's like, man, I wish I would have just been violent. Like, I wish I would've just tried to handle it violently. Yeah, but if you had to handle it violently, he would've went to the police. And then I would've ended up in jail. And then, but... the, police, and then the police would've cared. Right. Yeah. Then yeah. the police would've cared. But that's, and that's why I say it's like, it's tough. And like, I don't, I, I, prom I promise I, I really don't want to be disrespecting the Chinese government in this segment. Like, that's not my, my goal mm -mm. or my intention. But I'm just talking about what actually happened to me. Like, it and was an injustice. It was an injustice. And, it, and, and nothing came of it because I was a foreigner. If it would've been reverse, and I would have threw that chair to we'd them. Be, we'd be like, we'd be talking about free, free Adrian, Adrian. <laughs> free Adrian, free Wendell Brown. You know, it'd been the same situation. Like it'd been. Man, at that point, we've been wearing t-shirts though. Right. So it'd have been like. I'm not wearing a damn t-shirt. I'm wearing yeah. a t-shirt. But it it'd have been that same situation. Like like no, just no justice. No justice. No. I have uh, in 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 China, you get both, man. Like I've had opportunities that I got in China that I wouldn't have gotten in other places. Like I performed for Gay La Roche, like a uh, fashion show. I performed for Elliot, it's a clothing designer out of uh, out of Australia in a fashion show, like performing in Guangzhou Fashion Week, Shenzhen Fashion Week, something I always wanted to do. And I didn't get that opportunity until I was in China. So mm. there's two sides of it. I mean, there's things that would not have happened to me if I wasn't black in China, but there's things that happened t for me because I was. And so, um, it's a beautiful place. It's uh, my time is winding up, but I can't wait to go back and visit. And uh, we get married in Hong Kong, so uh, next month, January 11th. Well, maybe by the time this is out, we'll be married. But uh, yeah, like if you want to go to China, do it, do it, do it, do it. Anywhere, you want to go man. anywhere? I've been telling my cousins, my family, like travel, 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 travel. It's the most eye-opening experience, and it's worth every dollar. And if you're black. Special on planet Earth. Special. You from a diaspora nation, whether that be somewhere in the Caribbean, whether that's in North America, whether that's in South America, whether that's Europe. Fuck you, gotta lose. Right. Remember, the world is bigger than your block. For sure. And the world is also too small to live and die in one place. For sure. You know, that's the whole reason why this entire series was created. Mm -hmm. To show people that you could <laughs> you could live abroad. You could also die abroad. But still, yeah. the point is. Go abroad. Yeah. Well, you can always come back. 
Yeah, you can always come back. Yeah, you trust me. It back. ain't nothing about this. Yeah, ain't you got his mom on the show, so you know, you know it's real. Ain't yeah. nothing changed about this house. I've been gone <laughs> for five years. They put a new back porch out there, but I mean, it's still here. Like you can always come back home. So, yeah. well, indeed, Adrian. Oh, good to see you, man. man. Bless you guys, Thanks man. For coming out, coming down from the capital, the nation's <laughs> capital, up in there. Yo, thank the man for coming out, bro. My man. <laughs> oh my goodness, you ain't out. All right, man. Please tune in. Keep please, supporting us. Please, please. You know what I'm saying black in China is not just for us; it's for everyone. For everybody. Wait, wait. Last question. Yeah. Since you don't live here no more, is it? Can you still say that you personally put the ill in Danville, or is that like your cousin's job now? Since I mean, I mean, the ill will always be there since I put it there. Danville, Virginia. I put the ill in Danville. Don't tell nobody I said that. Uh, it's so it's the be. ill in Danville. I Yo, you said this at Fuchen. He's saying it again this time. This time in, in Danville. Danville. I put it there. The I ill. I put the ill in Danville. You know what? We probably gonna add that B roll here. I put the ill in Danville. Come back. Ill in Danville. Told you. <laughs> Classic. All right, man. Indeed, it's a good man. scene, bro. We gotta get out here before the sun goes down. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Watch the deer. <laughs> wow, yeah. Then anyway, cause where would you find the light if you don't know the darkness? That's my Bruce Lee's. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were trying to be Rick Jones. <laughs> <laughs> a Rick right, James. Guys, it sounds good on me, man. You take your sound. I'm good. All right. I did. Right when you want. Hey, word of advice: Chinese people do not use lines. Not use lines. I don't feel like they've seen the importance of them. Like, there's no point. You know, the the Q, as the English 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 say it, they don't use that either. <laughs> the Q, the line. So you go at McDonald's, you'll be standing in the line. There was not a line. It's just a line of people at the register, like vertical. And then you come with your you no know, what hor horizontal. You come and stand in a vertical line like we do in the West. And then somebody walk past you. And they start speaking Chinese, and I'm like, is, is she ordering? Like, is she ordering right now? Like, you, you just, no line, and then, and then they'll take their order, take their money really fast, they just throw the money at the cash register, and then you're still standing in line, and you're like, you're pissed, like you're upset, like because like first you're hungry, that's why you're standing in the McDonald's line in the first place. The next thing you know, like you've been jumped. Not once, and then if you, you you soak too long, you'll get jumped again. So you gotta hurry up and, and put your order in. And the reason why, like a lot of times you get jumped, because they can just jump up and say when they want Chinese, like I want, we got shoot out. It's like I want some fries. You know, they can say that really fast. Give them the money, bam, they're out. Um, but you, but me, the foreigner, I have to look at the little menu they have. So I had to walk up, grab.